The Herman Bierman Lecture recognizes Dr. Bierman's long and dedicated commitment to the SID. He served as president in 1947 and secretary treasurer for 16 years, 1950 to 1966. The award is given to a distinguished scholar, traditionally from a field other than dermatology. And this year is no exception, and I predict we are in for a treat. <laughs> Our awardee directs the connection science, can we forward the slide please, and human dynamics laboratory at MIT. He is the author of two books, Social Physics and Honest Signals and is among the world's most cited computational scientists. He has won the McKinsey Award from Harvard Business Review, the 40th anniversary of the Internet Award from DARPA, and the Brandeis Award for Work on Privacy. He is credited with advancing detection of barriers by future smart cars, wearable computing, <laughs> and sociometric badges that measure social interaction. Now, he has dined with royalty. He has staged fashion shows in Paris, Tokyo, and New York. And believe it or not, he has counted beavers from space. And in some circles, maybe he's better known as the elder brother of Alice, who tells me that the younger brother is also here today. Let us give a shout out to our Beerman lecturer, Alex Penton. Alex. OK, thank you. Good. Well, thank you for having me here today. Um, it's a little intimidating. There's a, boy, I'm going to give a lecture here. I think I had better not talk about health at all, because everybody in the room knows so much more about it than I do. But I do know about lots of different things, and, and some of them bear on health. And probably you don't know about some of these things, because they're new, or they're very different perspectives. So I thought I'd put together sort of a different view of science that is available to you now that's just beginning to creep in. Um, and I do a lot of different things, it's worth mentioning. Uh, so the work that I do has a lot of different uh, perspectives. So uh, at MIT, I helped set up the new Institute for Data Systems and Society. I work for the Secretary General of the UN on privacy and helping them uh, use data to be able to evaluate the, the sustainable development goals. Uh, I'm an advisor to the American Bar Association. You should be scared. <laughs> um, and I've worked with various big companies and so forth, as you'll see. Uh, oh, let me go back one. So social physics, that's the recent book that he talked about. Social physics is a phrase that is two centuries old. It was invented at the time the word physics became common instead of natural science or chemistry instead of alchemy. And what it was was the dream of using data and statistics to understand human society. It's the reason we have a census every 10 years or so. The difficulty, of course, with this is that they didn't have very much data in the early 1800s and they didn't have very much in the way of statistics. But now there's data everywhere. Every time you carry a phone, use a credit card, take a ride in an Uber, anything like that generates data. Enormous transactional data in your clinics and hospitals. And we have very advanced statistical techniques to be able to do things with this that you might not have thought possible. And so I thought it good to bring back this phrase, social physics, this dream of really understanding people. Um, so I did indeed find beavers from outer space. And I thought it was interesting to sort of take a look at because it gives a sense for what I do and what all this sort of breadcrumbs data that we leave behind us all the time
can be used. So, so this is a typical uh, sort of data that you get from space. Um, and if I tell you to count beavers, you'll notice, first of all, that you can't see anything smaller than um, a small house, a garage, perhaps. You say, well, how can you find beavers, right? Well, turns out beavers build dams. Dams collect water. The water is something you can see from space. So if you count the number of small ponds, you can estimate the number of beavers. Cool. So as I watch data from transactions with credit cards, from cell phones, from other sorts of things, these are proxies for human behavior, for the things that we experience. It's the same sort of idea. Now, also mentioned that um, in the early 1990s, uh, this was me, I'm the guy on the side there with the uh, strange sandals. They were fashionable then. Um, and we were experimenting with what the future would be like by building essentially things that were like cell phones, wearable computers, computers you wore on your body. You have to remember at this time, there were no cell phones. There had never been a cell phone. There was no wireless, there was no Wi-Fi, there was nothing like that. But we knew that it was coming and so I and my students decorated ourselves with these strange devices to ask what was it going to be like to live in the future. And there were all these cool things you could do. You could build things to remind you of people's names. You could find your directions so you'd never be lost. It was all these wonderful things. People thought it was great. But the universal comment was, nice, but I'll never wear anything like this, right? You wouldn't do it either. So what I did is I recruited fashion schools, and this is one from Paris, where I asked fashion students to say, well, as the technology develops, what will people actually use? And this is from 1995. There were no cell phones in the world, and they designed something that for all the world looks like an iPhone. It has a fingerprint reader, has a screen, flat screen. There were no flat screens in the world at that point, but it was clear that that would probably happen. Google Glass, that sort of funny thing. One of the students that did that went on to actually be the lead for Google Glass. So we were pretty good. But the thing that was most important was not iPhones or Google Glass, it was the data. Suddenly, for the very first time, you could see what people were doing on a millisecond by millisecond basis as they went through their life 24-7 for months or years at a time. And that was really revolutionary. Most of what we know about humans comes from very episodic sampling, from surveys. Moreover, it's limited to weird people. How many people know the, the sociological term weird? Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic, right? It's about 10% of the human population. Um, and it's a very unrepresentative part of the human population. But yet that's almost everything we know about ourselves because we just haven't been able to get out there and look at this stuff for the rest of the human population. So what I did when I noticed that we had this data as I went a little crazy. So one of the things we did is we built little tiny computers that looked like name badges, and we decorated people with them. So you all have name badges, but there's no electronics in them. But if I put electronics in them, I could tell who talks to who. Now, we never listen to words because that freaks people out. But you can look at, you know, did we talk? Did we talk? You can find silos and segmentation in the community did these people look at the poster or those people? So this is, for instance, a German bank. It has five departments. The blue stuff is all the email. And the red stuff are the face-to-face -face communications between these different work groups. And what you might notice if you watch it is that nobody talks to customer service until they deploy a product and then it's a disaster and what they do then is they have these big all-day meetings there with customer service to figure out what went wrong. Sounds probably a little like your organization or my organization. 
What it turns out is that most communication like this is not official, most effective communication is not official meetings. That's sort of reading out of things, but actually very few people talk. What the effective communication for many of these things is what happens in the halls before or after meetings, what happens around the water cooler, all of those sorts of things. And in fact, in this organization, the customer service people were in a different part of the building and nobody ever talked to them. So their concerns, their abilities were not integrated into the plans that they had and they ran into huge problems. Now I'll just note that hospitals and research institutions tend to be the same way. You cluster people that have very similar skills and they don't naturally run into the people who have other complementary areas. And when you deal with patient care, for instance, that's an enormous problem. Handoffs are known to be one of the worst things. Part of that is that you don't have coffee together. Right? So this is an architectural problem, actually. It's how do you seat people? Uh, part of the also limitation there is, is that when we set out seating charts or offices, we're static. Why doesn't this group sit with these people some days and those people other days? They could get to know people. They could do all sorts of things. What we find is when you change the pattern of serendipitous conversation, not something that's on the official org chart, you can get dramatic changes in productivity, dramatic changes in innovation. We're talking double digit changes. And this is in all sorts of industries, from drug discovery, through finance, through, through manufacturing even. Right? It's just the connections between people really matter, and we rarely think about that. Or if we do, we try to formalize it in text, electronic records. But it's the stuff around the coffee that really matters in many, many cases. So that's sort of the first thing. Let's look at a bigger thing. So this is data from the San Francisco Exploratorium. It's volunteer data. It's cell phone data, people moving around in San Francisco. The big dots are the most uh, uh, common places people go, stores, restaurants, bars. If you analyze it, you find out that San Francisco is not a single city. There's many sub-cities. And people tend to go to little clusters of places. And if they go to those clusters, they don't go to other places. So what they're doing is they're expressing their, their preferences by where they choose to spend time. And it's not just the thing you do. It's like you may like Tex-Mex -Tex or you may like you know, sushi or something like that. But there's a whole bundle of other things that go with it. So for instance, the bright green guys have almost an order of magnitude more frequency of alcoholism. The uh, dark green guys get diabetes almost three times as often as other people. We don't know why. They just have different patterns and preferences. It's never been studied. But if you cluster what their behavior is, you find these things for chronic diseases, diseases of behavior. You also get diseases of compliance. Now we can't study and haven't studied medical compliance, but we've studied fiscal compliance. So for instance, one group doesn't pay back their credit card bills. <laughs> okay? What happens is there gets within a group that spend time together. They may not know each other, but they forge a norm of behavior. They learn from each other. They observe each other, even though they don't necessarily know each other. And they adopt these different styles of living. Some of them have bad things because they lead to disease states. Some of them have good things. There's various different things that happen. And this is the nature of humanity when seen through this big data. This is cell phone data, but you can do the same thing from geolocated credit card data and several other things, Wi-Fi data. There's lots of ways to do it. And that led to David Lazar, who's a political scientist, and me writing this paper in science uh, about this new science, computational social science. It's like watching an anthill. It's like watching beavers from outer space. It's trying to understand human society in a holistic way from its behavior, 
rather than what we say about ourselves. Facebook, things like that, are what we like to advertise, but they're not who we really are. Where we really are, where we devote our time and the behaviors that we have. So along with that computational science, which incidentally, since we published this, has been cited something like 3,000 times, and more importantly, several hundred academic departments had been set up in the United States to study this using that title. That's amazing. In less than 10 years, we have this sort of revolution in understanding people. We also have concerns about privacy, because this data came about without anybody thinking about, oh, how else is it going to be used? It was just to make the cell phone use or the credit card use. And so I wrote a whole bunch of papers about this um, and was able to start a discussion at Davos, the World Economic Forum, with the Justice Minister of the EU and the Chairman of the Federal Trade Commission. And that discussion was very fruitful and eventually ended up in the General Data Protection Regulation, which is the European Privacy Act. So uh, you can blame me at least partly. Um, and that is sort of the battle that we have. The utility as science, the utility that we see in, for instance, our maps and Google Maps and things like that versus privacy. And the core thing with uh, GDPR, it's a little like HIPAA, but updated, and I would argue that HIPAA needs to be updated. It basically gives people rights over their own data. And now the battles are raging across the Atlantic and elsewhere to make companies comply. Just today or yesterday, you saw both Google and Facebook declare that they were brand new companies and they were going to be privacy. We'll see. This battle is not going to happen quickly, right? So what are some of the other things that you learn? Well, you learn things that are surprising that don't match the way we've traditionally thought about ourselves. So we think of ourselves in most of our sciences as rational individuals. And people are, well, we're not really rational, right? We have limits and blah, blah, blah. And I think the real problem is we're not individuals. We learn from each other. We get opportunities from each other. That means our decision making depends on the social context in ways we are often not conscious of. So this is the Nobel Prize winning work of uh, Tversky and Kahneman. Much of our behavior is unconsciously learned from others. And what this graph shows is, I uh, talked to a telephone company into interviewing 100,000 people uh, in terms of their jobs and education and income and gender and every, all those sorts of things. It's just pretty amazing that they did this. Um, and because they're a telephone company, they know where these people go. They know they're for this cell tower, then that cell tower, and this other cell tower. And they know, oh, they call people over at that cell tower. So we don't know who the people are, right? But we do know something about their demographics. And we can look at the richness and diversity of their social network. And you can look at it in terms of what sort of areas do they go to? What physical places do they visit? Or what are the jobs that the, of the other people that they call? Or where do they live? And regardless of how you measure the diversity of the social network, you find this very strong correlation with income. People who make more money have more diverse social networks. That means they talk to more different sorts of people. And there's a mathematical definition of this that's related to entropy. Right? It's not just a qualitative thing. What's interesting is, is if you look at people with high education versus low education, it moves that curve up and down just a little. This is a much bigger effect than, for instance, education, which is surprising. Also, health things. If you see somebody who has a certain level of diversity and that diversity then collapses, so they become less diverse, that means that they're under stress of some sort. Typically, that's an early warning sign of health problems. In fact, you can use that sort of measurement to do quality of life estimates, and you can get very, very good, as good as, for instance, the OASIS form, which determines reimbursement for visiting nurses. So you can begin doing disease prevention by watching for changes in behavior. 
And colloquially, we know that. You look a little, you're behaving a little different today. You feeling okay? We say that to each other. What is it we're watching? Well, we're watching these sorts of behavior, subtle behavioral changes. Unfortunately, in our society, it's not just a matter of investing in more diversity, more social network that generates income. It goes both ways, of course. You uh, invest in diversity, you're more likely to make income. If you get more income, you're likely to be able to afford to have the diversity. But it doesn't work the same way for everybody. So you can classify people by their job type into high status and low status. And you can ask about, for a given level of diversity in your social network, how much economic return do you have? And it turns out that high status people get a lot more benefit from networking than low status people. Okay? So there's a structural impediment. It's not education. It's not culture. It's, just, it's that if you're in a low status thing, the returns to the sort of things that find you opportunities are lower than if you're a high status person. And actually, I will argue with you that the main function of college, undergraduate, is to teach you how to network with high status people. And that lets you go out into the world and, and, and reap benefits from that. It has other consequences. The fact that low status people have less returns is not an accident. It's because they network almost entirely with low status people. High status people network with high status people. Surprise! Um, so if you look at shopping, so the vertical axis is your uh, socioeconomic index. The horizontal axis is the same. And what you've got here is you've got low status people interacting with low status, so that's the bright bread. You know, middle income with middle income, high status with high status. They do it for where they shop, where they spend time, and who they talk to. In other words, people are highly segregated, not as a function of the physical thing only, but in terms of when you look at their behavior. The opportunities available to you are very different than somebody who's in a low status job because you network with high status people. And they have bigger opportunities, more money, Low status people don't. Another thing happens, which we see rather dramatically in this country today, which is because they don't talk to each other, they develop very different theories about the world. So this happens to be Twitter, but it's true of most everything. So these are sort of two, these are eigenvectors of the topic matrix. Don't worry about it, it's what they're talking about. Low-income low people, who mostly talk to low-income people, have a very different set of concerns, topics, and theories about the world than higher-income people. Low status, if you do status, it's even more clear. So sound, that sort of polarization sound familiar? And what we believe from the data, but can't prove absolutely, is that the primary driver of echo chambers is not Facebook. It's the fact that the poor people only talk to the poor people and the rich people only talk to the rich people. And then Facebook amplifies that. But it's not the primary driver of it. So we're all angry at Facebook, good. But let's get like angry at this other thing, which is how segregated our society is by behavior. You say, well, OK, so we know about this. You know, like they have those like neighborhoods that are all poor and neighborhoods that are all rich. And you know, what are we going to do? We try affordable housing. It doesn't really work, the evidence says. So what are we going to do? Well, actually, it turns out that affordable housing and things like that and the way we think about it is wrong. Not that those are bad things, but there's a wrong way to think about it. So we just released this. Note the website, inequality.media.mit. And Esteban Morrow, who's a faculty member that works with me, is the lead on it, and some of my graduate students. And what we're doing is we're looking at the behavioral inequality of every major city in the US. And this is all going to be online. 
And what that means is when you look at a store, who are the people that go there? Is it just rich people or just poor people? Or is it a nice mixture? So a way to think about this is the way it says there, and you can find a lot more detail about this. The average person interacts with about 5,000 people every year. These are people in your neighborhood that you can observe, not just neighborhood where you live, but where you work, where you travel, where you shop. So you can observe about 5,000 people a year. However, the people you observe may be all people like you. And the question arises, how does that happen? So let's hear, this is something just outside my office. There's two food places, Chipotle and Clover. One, Clover, has only rich people go there pretty much. Okay, same price point as Chipotle, but Chipotle is very mixed. So those little things, the, 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 those are income levels down there. I forget what people know and don't know about this. So segregation happens when you're standing there on the street and you make the decision as a high income person to go to Clover because it's full of people who look like you. And you don't go to Chipotle because that's sort of déclassé, right? And besides, those people doesn't look like the sort of people I want to hang with, right? Now you may not do that consciously. I'm sure we're all good citizens, right? But we do it. And in fact, that accounts for three two-thirds of all the segregation in the United States. It's not the fact that the neighborhood's poor over here and the rich neighbor over there. It's the fact that when you make choices about where to go, and the poor people make choices about where to go, even if it's right there, even if it's the same price, you choose to go with people that are like you. As a consequence, you are not exposed to people who are not like you. And you develop all these theories about how the world is happening and what's the right way to behave. And it's very different than the theories that they evolve. And then you see what they say online, you go, those idiots. But they have this sort of coherent discussion going, just like you do. It's just the discussions don't bump. So you can map a map of places and you ask, well, distance from home, segregation level, and it's clear, the most segregated places in America are schools. Maybe pawn shops, too. <laughs> Factories are very segregated. Science museums are awesome. Everybody goes there with their kids. That's pretty good. Supermarkets are not so bad. Grocery stores are not so good. Doctor's offices are a little good. I suspect what that means is doctor's offices are cited in places that are relatively homogeneous and draw from a demographic that's relatively homogeneous. But they are a lot more mixed than, say, church or high school or offices, which is an opportunity for you if you're involved in that. Hospitals are even more, segre are more mixed. They're not on this one. Um, they're farther from home. But it's an opportunity for people to mix. And you can imagine doing things that allow these different groups to talk to each other and bounce their worldviews off of each other. It might be a good thing. At any rate, let me end there. Um, there's a couple books. Social physics I talked about. Trust data is the framework that the Obama White House asked us to put together. Uh, together with the Secretary General and the World Economic Forum about how we should handle data and privacy. So if you're interested in that, it has a vision of the world and how it should actually be handled. I'm happy to announce that the EU is adopting that framework. So I just keynoted Eurostat, which is the official uh, uh, organization in charge of data for all of the EU. Uh, and they're like buying into it. So if you're interested in this stuff, there's a place to learn about it. And I see I have 28 seconds, 27 seconds left. Uh, so I did good. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. The bottom line is, is that we now have data resources to ask questions in ways we never could before. Universal data, inclusive of everybody. Behavior 
not just opinion, not just acute, chronic. And, and as you all know, but probably don't integrate as much into your practice, maybe you more than most medical practices, behavior is a lot of health, not only for prevention, but compliance for treatment. You have to be able to look at these broad swaths of behavior and how ideas, how norms of behavior spread to be able to really move the needle there. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you.